Thank you for that nice introduction. And this has been really a great visit. So you guys had a lot of really exciting stuff going on. And really uh, enjoyed the warm welcome and the, and the fun conversations. So um, as Jeremy said, my, my group covers a, a couple of different areas of research. Um, and in principle, there's supposed to be some sort of synergy and organization to this, to this diagram. It sometimes works better than others in that sense. Um, but today, um, I'm going to be focusing mostly on these new magnetic materials. Um, and that uh, touches on magnetization dynamics and nanoscale phenomena as well. But sort of the, the push, if you will, is from the new materials direction. Um, so uh, just think, because I always run out of time for you in this slide at the end, I want to thank everybody who actually did the work up front. These are all uh, current and former uh, graduate students from my group including one uh, sort of pending former uh, graduate student and people are looking for a postdoc. This guy is uh, really top rate and has done uh, some of the work you'll see here. And uh, we also have uh, you know, a lot of uh, input from external collaborators. Um, any any uh, project like this takes a lot of, a lot of hands pulling it together. Um, so I want to start and talk about sort of just generally one of the reasons why um, you shouldn't be afraid of organic materials. <laughs> so I know, uh, you know my, my background is solid state physics, and you talk to most people uh, from that field, and you get some sort of allergic reaction when organics come up. Um, but I just wanna, wanted to point out that this is not all sort of uh, either uh, mysterious squishy physics or, or completely uh, useless proof of principle. So organic semiconductors are making big inroads in technologies, most notably in displays, um, but also uh, potentially in electronics as well. But if you sort of compare this portfolio to inorganic materials, uh, spin and magnetism is almost completely lacking. And um, one of the reasons for that is that uh, finding that there there are uh, find, finding an appropriate organic-based magnetic material to complement to make flexible displays um, is a challenge. Uh, I think the material we're going to be talking about today is I think has potential here. Um, we're certainly not going to be talking about anything this far downstream, but just to point out that this is a big gap in existing application space, um, that the organic materials and magnetic organic materials have the potential to fill. Um, so I want to spend some time now sort of introducing this material because, uh, as I said, it's, it's unconventional uh, by, by most solid state standards and probably many of you have not heard of it before. So after extensive uh, chemistry training, I can pronounce vanadium tetracyanoethylene, um, uh, TCNE, or VTCNE is the name I'll be giving it throughout the talk. Um, so the TCNE molecule is this blue H shape here where these lighter blue atoms are nitrogen groups. So that carbon nitrogen is a cyano bond. And this material forms as a, as a bulk material. So it's not a polymer, it's not a small molecule. It's coordinated through these vanadium. So uh, every vanadium connects to six different nitrogen groups. And then vanadium can talk to vanadium through the molecular orbitals of this TC. So, um, through various structural characterization techniques, this local ordering around the vanadium is very well defined. So it's, it's not amorphous, it's not random, but uh, long range structural order is harder to identify. And I'll come back to that later in the talk, but for now we can think of it as either somewhere between amorphous and polycrystalline with very small grain size. Um, so uh, in addition to sort of making an electrical connection here as an organic semiconductor, uh, allowing hopping transport throughout the material. You also have an exchange interaction whereby the vanadium, which starts off with five electrons, donates two charges to the neighboring TCNE, giving them a negative charge and an excess moment. So then you end up with antiferromagnetic ordering locally between a TCNE and a vanadium, or ferrimagnetic ordering locally. So this is a, a compensated antiferromagnetic imperfectly compensated antiferromagnet, so you have some remnant moment. Uh, you know, you can just do it by counting. You have three electrons on the vanadium pointing one direction. The two electrons that get kicked off 
into the pi star orbitals of the TCD point in the opposite direction, so you're left with one net four magneton per formula unit um, of magnetization. One quick question. So, yep. the, the, so there's a paper that you're citing from 1991, yep. high profile. Mm -hmm. Presumably, this these TCNE. So, do people forget about it, or like <laughs> what's, what, what's going on? <laughs> That's an excellent, uh, excellent question. So, um, this is one of these questions of science sociology that I'm not sure I have like a clear answer for. I can I can tell you sort of my best guess is that the synthesis is medium hard for a chemist. So it's not easy for a chemist, which would make it barely accessible for a physicist. Um, so there, there's some energy barrier to getting into the field. Um, and a lot of the materials properties that I've been selling as I've wandered around today were not evident in this first publication. So the Curie temperatures in that publication was, I think, around 400K, 350 to 400K. Um, and the material uniformity was not as good. Um, and also a big part of it is sort of if you compare this timeline to the timeline of inorganic spintronics, um, it wasn't clear what to do with a magnetic material in 1991. So some of this is just sort of you know, uh, an idea before its time and then other fields catch up and sort of some of those synergies become apparent, et cetera. So we can maybe come back to this in, sure, sure. in, in a couple slides when I provide a little bit more context. But that's that's my best guess. Yeah. Why did that thing Jan Teller distort? Uh, it's got all that degeneracy. So, so usually when things have degeneracy, there's a possibility of distorting the Jan Teller effect and removing the degeneracy. To the T two G with the yeah, three yeah. spins on it. You know, what, why are, but why are those three spins yeah. still energy why degenerate? Why don't tell her to start and do something? Um, couldn't. I don't know. So this is this is not this is not a model we developed. This comes out of sort of these references. Um, so I can tell you that uh, this math of getting one Bohr magneton per formula unit to within the experimental. Act uh, accuracy is borne out. So, um, if there's symmetry breaking here, um, it's not suppressing the magnetic ordering. Um, I will say, in my opinion, the charge transport in this material is not well understood. So it's, it's in this regime of many organic semiconductors where you can think of it as a either a pretty good hopping transport or a pretty terrible band transport. Um, but it's also potentially ambipolar. So if you so this is what this is supposed to indicate. And, and again, some of this is sort of received orthodoxy from prior people in the field that I'm not, we're still in the process of sorting out how much of this we believe and how much we don't. But uh, if you want to call this the, the homo and this the lumo, is the pot so the conduction band effectively is on the, sits on the TC and E sites, and it's in this pi star orbital, but it's energy shifted from this state by the Coulomb occupation energy, uh, and then exactly where these T two G orbitals sit in this gap is a little bit of guesswork. So you can do sort of thermal activation measurements, and you get an activation energy of a half an EV. So if you believe a simple band model, then that, that's where this comes from. But if it's, if it's a hopping conductor, then that activation energy means something different. And so conventionally, the, the solid state physics way to resolve this is do a careful temperature dependence and do log log plots. Um, the challenge here is that this material is deposited at about 350 Kelvin. <coughs> uh, that's, that's where it grows. So you can't make it much hotter than that without decomposing it. And if you cool it down, the carriers freeze out by about 150 Kelvin. So that's just not many decades of temperature to get a reliable fit to sort of do some of these power law analyses and say, well, this really is hopping, this really is band light, this really is whatever. So uh, 
it's not a direct answer to your question about why it wouldn't, um, but I'm, you know, I'm an experimentalist, so I guess saying from the experimental point of view, understanding what are these, what, what are these states what, that we can measure, you know, um, that's, that's, I guess, the, the closest I can get. They, they, they probably, they are somewhere in that gap. <laughs> they're, they're at least not quenching the magnetic order. Um, so, uh, talking a little bit about how this material is grown, I said it was sort of medium hard. The thing that makes it medium hard is this is not a co commercially available reagent. So this VCO6, we have to synthesize ourselves. Um, and you know, it's the kind of thing most chemists would be able to do, maybe with a little bit of practice to get it right. Um, the TCME is commercially available. But once we have those compounds, we basically just put them into the inlets of this reactor. We use argon uh, vapor phase transport to bring the precursors into the reaction zone here um, and set the substrate temperature um, independently from the precursor temperatures to sort of control the stoichiometry um, and deposit. And so the we get we typically operate at say 50 C or 350 Kelvin, depending on how you want to look at it. It's uh, ambient pressure in a glove box, so a little bit above atmospheric pressure, um, and seems to deposit on pretty much anything uh, that's reasonably clean. So it doesn't seem to like substrates with a lot, with organic solvent residue or that are dirty, sometimes it won't deposit, but anything that is a sort of reasonably clean surface, it seems to deposit. Um, and so uh, one, of the, one of the things uh, that I've also been saying uh, as I talk to people throughout the day is I think this material system is heavily undersubscribed. And so very happy to share everything we know about how to make it, if anybody else is interested in, or to share samples if that's more appropriate. But in the first uh, instance, we, took, we sort of had a fun experiment here. I don't know if anybody else has ever even heard of this journal. Um, when they contacted us, this was the first I'd heard of it. It's the Journal of Visualized Experiments. So you can actually go see the 15 minutes of fame of my graduate students videotaping the synthetic process and sort of the full synthetic recipe about how to generate this, this, this material. Um, so that's how we produce it. Um, that's a lot of buildup. Let me start talking about why I'm here and why I think you should care about it. So this is the hysteresis and the temperature dependence of uh, thin film deposited on, I think in this case it was probably glass. Um, and coming back to Jeremy's question, this is the 1991 paper, which was uh, powder derived from solution phase synthesis uh, around 96, uh, or sorry, just before 2000 first CVD synthesis uh, occurred, which helped the Curie temperature a little bit. And the reason why this curve is, is looks the way it does is no dramatic insight. It's basically just sort of slowly and carefully, systematically getting better control of the growth conditions and all the sort of the grunt work of material science that makes things go. Um, and so this 600 Kelvin Curie temperature is sort of more or less our current state of affairs for optimized material. There's some structure uh, in M versus T, which I can talk about in a second. But uh, if you just do a very crude analysis at room temperature, it's within 85% of its maximum magnetization. And extrapolating to extract TC is a little bit tricky because there's a low temperature magnetic phase here, which sort of limits our ability to fit reasonably to low temperature. So if you fit just this region to a block law, you get uh, an energy scale of about 600 kilometers. You'll notice at room temperature, we have pretty sharp switching. We have pretty high remnants. It's pretty well saturated. In fact, this uh, curve gets worse at low temperature, which is interesting. And I think that's connected to this sort of reentrant phase here, where it becomes more disordered uh, at low temperature, more antiferromagnetic. I think this is actually related to carrier freeze out, coming back to, uh, I think, really interesting and outstanding questions about how transport works here. Because I think that. High temp the presence of high temperature at high temperature of more delocalized carriers helps to stabilize and <coughs> homogenize the magnetic phase. It, the it goes up again. <coughs> yeah, so I think this is probably dilute paramagnetic impurities uh, in, in the film somewhere. At a guess. 
But then you're measuring magnetization, not susceptibility. Uh, well, it's it's in a finite field. Um, oh, okay. It's it's in a hundred oh, gauss okay. field. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's very hard to measure just magnetization. Usually, for a squid measurement, you apply a modest field to just get everything pointed in the same direction. So you're not like in this case, we want to measure at a field high enough that we're not seeing weird domain well effects in the temperature dependence. So we just want to be looking at the magnetization. Yeah. How thick are the thin films? Um, our typical growth is about 200 to 300 nanometers. We've grown as low as 50 nanometers okay. and as thick as 10 microns. Okay. Um, we haven't had any particular reason to make it thin. Mm -hmm. uh, making it thick um, makes some of the properties better, which I'll get to oh, in a bit. Um, yeah, so, so this is sort of the, the state of affairs when, when we got involved with the field. Um, well, I guess I should say th this data point is where we got involved. Um, and we're looking for, oh, sorry, yeah, I forgot the slide was here. So this is just a cartoon version of the, the carrier delocalization argument that I was putting forward. Where I think as the carriers become, if, if this green color you can think of as the, the length scale of a tip of an electron in the system, as it gets colder and it freezes out maybe to within a structural domain, then the film becomes more disordered, the net magnetization decreases, it becomes, one could say glassier, although I think that's formally not correct because there's still some local anisotropy within the grains. Um, but qualitatively, that's, that's probably a reasonable approximation and then more uniform at high temperature. Um, What's very magnetic? So this is a, 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 a term, some some theorists coined for something that's almost a glass but has local anisotropy. So it's, it's in the literature, so I mentioned it for that. Every, every you know, fifth to tenth time I give this talk, there's someone in the back who <laughs> gets very excited about spare magnetism. Um, and then there's usually some, yeah, and then the, the sign of the excitement flips. Right away. <laughs> so, oh, but yes, that's exactly a spare magnet. No, that's, that's completely not what a spare magnet is. It's, it's so that you know, you know how sort of debates can get. But um, I'm, yeah, so in terms of what to call the phase, I'm agnostic. But uh, in the terms of the physics, um, we're in the process of trying to, to nail this down uh, with more experiments. But I think qualitatively, we have a lot of indirect evidence to support that something like that's happening. Um, so yeah, so then uh, this was sort of the first uh, experiment we got involved in in 2011, which was sort of appropriate at the time for interest in spintronics, was all about generating spin polarized charge current. So we made a LED structure and deposited a thin layer of VTC and E on the N type electrode. Then driving current through the VTC and E layer acts as a spin filter. So you're injecting spin polarized carriers into this quantum well, and then by monitoring the polarization of the luminescence, of the electroluminescence, you can monitor the spin polarization of the electron current. And for detailed reasons that aren't probably worth going into, the heavy hole and the light hole give different polarization response. You can see here though in the heavy hole band that you get a polarization response in red that mimics in green the magnetization response of the film, so it acts as a spin injector. So um, we're excited about this result because uh, this is the first time uh, we believe that, uh, that uh, anyone was able to demonstrate extracting a spin polarized current from an organic. So uh, there is a, a reasonably active field of organic spintronics, but um, almost universally the organic uh, in those structures it acts as a channel rather than as the source of spin. Um, and the other reason I included this slide was to show sort of how, how uh, you know, the Hannibal Lecter approach to sample fabrication that's sometimes necessary for air sensitive materials. So this is a, a sample can that can go into our glow box. We can do uh, metal deposition, uh, some, some combination of pre-patterning and metal post, uh, and then post- Sorry, can you describe event. in more detail this Hannibal Lecter? <laughs> so, this large square is the substrate covered in VTC&E. Okay. This narrow slot 
is the mesa of our LED. Um, and then we deposit photoresist everywhere and open a window right above the mesa. Uh, so most, so this black is VTC and E, which is deposited but irrelevant for the measurement. Then we put down a layer of aluminum because aluminum on VTC and E is a relatively happy deposition. Um, but then the uh, aluminum isn't as conductive as it could be, so we put on, it's a final step, a little strip of gold here, an indium bond, which goes to uh, feed throughs out of this can. So this can has windows on it, so we can essentially seal it up in the glove box, take it down to our cryostat or spectrum mag, you know, attach it to a stick, drop it down, uh, and do the measurement. And so this is another reason why, uh, in answer to Jeremy's question, maybe why this material hasn't been more popular, is that this is the kind of thing one had to do to do, to, to do an experiment. Is you had to either come up with an experiment you can do in a glove box, or you had to come up with some, again, medium level of complication in terms of uh, sample handling um, to get it into your apparatus. So is that hermetically sealed with some O-ring? Yeah, saying? so it's got an indium ring. Indium O ring because we wanted to make it cold. Yeah. So what's it sensitive to? What, what's oxygen? Oxygen. Both. Okay. And what, what's going to happen to the molecule? Remember, uh, we're discussing this earlier. I'm not a chemist, so I can't tell. Well, I, I, <laughs> I, I don't think I can give you a very sophisticated chem, chemical okay. answer, but I can. But vanadium oxidizes as the bottom. So we thought it will. It is favorable for it to convert. Yeah. Vanadium ox, ox, oxygen bonds are more stable than vanadium nitrogen bonds. Does will that pervade? That will go through the whole entire. Uh, it does actually. So I was gonna say you have like a nice oxide layer to make a top gate then if you just like, <laughs> if if we were fortunate enough for yeah. it to be self-limiting. So the material goes down as this blue black color. Uh -huh. If you take it out of the glove box and put it on your desk within half an hour it becomes transparent. Okay. Uh, Got it. Thank you. Um you can uh, with aluminum, which works reasonably well, um, but aluminum is a conductor, right? so not every experiment works for that. Um, well, to give away a punchline from a little later in the talk, what we developed uh, more recently is they make epoxies that we pirated from the OLED community that are specifically designed to not react to other organic molecules. And so by coating that with epoxy and then putting a top piece of glass or sapphire on top, we can um, stabilize it um, for the you know weeks to, to a month um, under ambient conditions. So this is one of the one of the innovations we've been able to come up with in the last couple of years. Um, so this was a, at the time you know this was an interesting proof of principle. We were working with Art Epstein, who was one of the co-discoverers of the material, who's at OSU. Um, and then right around just after this paper came out, Art retired. Um, and so we had to make a decision about what we wanted to do. And in addition, um, we made a great spin LED, um, and I've published other papers with that technique. And uh, I would be the first person to say spin LEDs are great for demonstrating physics, and as far as I can tell, completely useless for anything else. So there's not really like a, a, a worldwide drive to get more spin LEDs. And the, the field of inorganic spintronics, or spintronics more broadly, was moving away from this DC injection spin fed sort of picture and moving towards these dynamic excitations which um, in, in some sense are, are, are maybe closer to what magnets and spin want to do naturally. So they have magnetic resonance uh, in the gigahertz range and by pumping those resonances you can drive pure spin currents across interfaces from ferromagnets and the non-magnetic materials. So this was first demonstrated in inorganic magnetic systems. More recently, this has been shown uh, for organics here, uh, papers by uh, Saito and Seringhouse, um, where um, this is maybe the, the easiest figure to see. This is the microwave absorption tuning through uh, the magnetic resonance of a permaloy layer. Um, and they get a readout um, in the microvolt range uh, of a transverse voltage coming from the inverse uh, spin Hall effect, in principle demonstrating spin, spin injection. So these experiments, though, uh, if anybody has, has looked into this field, are messy <laughs> and hard to interpret. Uh, the, the shortest way to say it is 
uh, that's a one microvolt signal in an fMR cavity where you're putting in hundreds of uh, milliwatts of microwave radiation. So uh, artifacts are a big problem, um, which is one of the reasons that more recently, I uh, was very uh, excited to see this collaboration out of the Bowman and Bernani groups in Utah, where they did some very clever things in designing their microwave environment to effectively uh, put an in parallel capacitor with their their sample, which shorts out many of the artifacts, and they did some careful systematics. They also systematically varied the molecule to vary its spin orbit coupling um, and used the molecule itself as the spin hollow material. And so demonstrated, I think, very interesting spin pumping into an organic system. But just like my earlier comments about organic electronics, in all of, the, all of these systems, the organic is playing a passive role. It's the, it's the channel for spin. And so this was uh, an impetus for us to consider the microwave uh, resonance properties of BTCD. So the question became, can BTCD act as the pump in these systems? And so this is really, you know, uh, to butcher uh, a quote, the, the FMR spectrum that launched a thousand ships. Right? So uh, this is uh, just from a commercial EPR spectrometer, and you can see the line width for this particular scan is a little bit longer a little bit wider than one gauss at 10, gig 10 gigahertz, which is extremely sharp. Um, and in fact, when we first saw it, the reason why there's this inset with control panel, or control measurements, is we looked at our two precursors to see if they were giving the same signal because this looks like ESR. You just generally don't see FMR line that's that narrow. Um, and so in the context of this new direction for spintronics writ large, we thought we got very excited about the potential for this system. So to help calibrate for people who um, may not be as familiar with either this concept or just this units, right, because there's many different ways one can represent the width of the resonance, there's sort of a list of typical magnetic materials and the, the, the width of their magnetic resonance. And so um, metals, magnetic metals are generally terrible. Um, YIG has been the benchmark for decades, for 50 years or so. Um, and in thin film, the very best samples grown at high temperature on GGG can give you a line width of about one gauss or one ersted. Um, if you take bulk single crystal YIG and polish it into a sphere, you can get down to about half that. This is now from a BT, one of our 10 micron thick VTC and E films. And the, way, the reason the thickness helps you here is there's um, magnon magnon scattering that happens at interfaces. So it's gen generically true of all these materials that as you make them thinner, the line widths get broader. So having a bulk material can help your line width. So now we've taken that uh, line width that was a little larger than a gauss for the thinner films. For these thicker films, it's now getting close to the polished jig microsphere, which is basically the gold standard for magnetic resonance. So this, coming back to Jeremy's very nice introduction, this is sort of why uh, I think we have reason uh, to claim that these materials are competitive um, with really the best magnetic materials out there. So, um, what's going on with that spectrum? Why doesn't it come back? Uh, so this is the, yeah, this is just a measurement artifact. So this is uh, before I was showing you a derivative scan, which yeah. is how the data is measured. Right. Uh, so this is the integral of that. Oh. So any small Right. sort of Any slope point or point. weird offset in the background of the microwave response will show up. And that kind of stuff. So I'll uh, just skip through this. This is basically just what I said earlier. That this is what happens if you leave an unprotected film out. If you protect it, it's good to the eye uh, for a month. If you want to look at it a little bit more carefully, this is now log scale in hours, so this point here is about two weeks as a calibration. And so the, the remnants dies faster than other properties, but um, this is just measuring the DC magnetization, and depending on what you care about, you can get uh, a few weeks to a month out of it. Um, we have unpublished data with uh, F thick FMR films um, showing that they were good like, for similar time scales. To, uh, so are these just long. left in air? Yep. I see. But just if you, sitting you, on if you keep them in a dry, in a dry, dry 
nice uh, environment. Yeah, if you keep them in a glove box, they last much longer. And if you keep them cold, they last forever. Okay, so uh, that took about half my time, but that's basically the introduction. So that's, that's sort of laying the foundation for what these materials are, um, why we're interested in them, and sort of what the state of the art as n minus one or n minus two years uh, was. So for the rest of the talk, and we'll just go as long as I have time for, and just feel free to ask questions. We can dynamically tune sort of uh, what we're working on right now. So, uh, the first uh, first topic is just that even though we started off inspired by sort of this next generation spintronics concept, it turns out that the just the parameters that we were getting were sufficiently good that we decided, well, you know, there's much more, in some sense, vanilla, but still very impactful microwave electronics that we can do. Um, and so the experiment here is basically just taking two microwave antennas um, and bridge them with a bar of VTC and E. Um, and so the microwave field from this antenna will excite a spin wave in one end of this bar that then propagates to the other antenna and shows up as microwave transmission. And so you can see here, this is sort of the real space image of what this looks like. Um, this is a collaboration with Hong Tang's group at Yale and Michael Flate's group at the University of Iowa. And so um, that allows us to now do broadband FMR, and so you can see these very sharp resonances um, persist uh, across a wide frequency range. The difference in amplitude here uh, still unpacking a little bit. I'm not sure; it's not clear yet if that's intrinsic to the VTC and E or just has to do with the measurement circuit being sort of better and worse coupled. But um, these Q of 3,000 or 2,000 depending on the different field orientation, in-plane and out-of-plane, are comparable to the one gauss line with regime. Um, and you know, I'll show you the thicker films in a second. But because it's broadband, um, we can track and extract the gyromagnetic ratio and the saturation magnetization. Um, and this uh, matches what we see in DC uh, and cavity FMR reasonably well. And so this, this is comparable to the 700 mil Ersted uh, line width I showed earlier. And now you can start to see for, for a thick film, so this is now a 10 micron film, that we're seeing very distinct peaks, very clear spin wave resonances um, coming out of, of the broadband FMR. So um, this is, uh, as, as I say in the last bullet, uh, very competitive with YIG. Um, and demonstrates that you can make practical microwave devices. And so now, this direction of research, we're sort of continuing our work uh, with the TAN group to try and make more useful. I and mean, this is sort of the microwave equivalent of a resistor. And it's just uh, you know, uh, connected to two antennas. We can, we're trying to now move on to make filters and circulators and more sophisticated structures. So in a different direction, but one that you know has potential to circle back, we also have discovered really fascinating things about the morphology. So because this is a CDD deposition, um, it comes down conformally, and in collaboration with uh, George Schmidt's group at uh, University of Halle, we decided to try and make it corrugated, with the idea being that we would make a conformal film, and then use the shape anisotropy uh, of that corrugation to induce some in-plane magnetic anisotropy, just because the films as deposited have no uh, in-plane anisotropy at all, and that's a degree of freedom we'd like to have. So the first time we did a deposition, we just threw it in the SEM, so some of this is oxidized, uh, but we just wanted to see what we've done, and we were very surprised to see this. So what you see is some sort of ripening um, happening at the, well, it's not totally obvious from this picture, but um, from some diagnostic growth, it starts at the corners, that it deposits faster than on the edges, and then as these corners grow out, they start to shadow the trenches, and so then you're just depositing on top of the platform, and you end up, as you can see in these two different perspectives, with arrays of nanowires. Um, and so that was very cool, we thought. So then we tried to look at the anisotropy, measuring 
uh, DC magnetization parallel and perpendicular. Um, this is not really the best way to measure magnetic in isometric. So we can see that those two curves are different, but extracting parameters from that is, is, is challenging. So what we did was we went back to fMR and we varied the in-plane angle. So that's this waterfall plot here. You can see this very clear sinusoidal oscillation, uh, which we fit and extract here to the black data points. So for comparison, the open squares are for uh, a continuous thin film. And so um, this variation in the center field is, is a measure of the strength of the anisotropy field. And, and this is um, comparable to the saturation magnetization. So this is, this is a very large anisotropy for the material. Um, and so that's not necessarily surprising because you're making wires and wires are anisotropic. So one might expect, well, we do some calculation for shape anisotropy. Magnetization perpendicular to the wire should be the same as magnet, different from magnetization along the wire. So we tried to do this by doing a thickness dependence, which uh, you can see overlaid here, as well as varying the pitch of the array to, to vary their overlap. Um, and as you can see, this is probably the most dramatic case. So this is a 1.4 micron film. So this is the black dots here. So the film's completely recoalesced. So if I was going to do a magnetostatic modeling of this, it would look like a thin film. Uh, from the top, you can still see ridges. So there's some sort of memory in the material of the fact that it started off as individual wires. If you look carefully, you can see sort of faint vertical striations here. So there's some sort of interface that persists even after it recoalesces. But as far as dipole fields are concerned, that doesn't matter. But the, magne the, the anisotropy is exactly the same as for well-isolated nanowires. So what this means is this anisotropy is in fact not shape anisotropy. And really there's only one candidate left, and that's some sort of crystal field anisotropy. So coming back to the very beginning of the talk when I was discussing you know, the crystallinity or lack thereof of these systems, the only way we can be getting in-plane anisotropy out of this film is if there's some preferred molecular order and that ordering is not there in a uniform thin film. It's positive on a flat substrate. So something about these interfaces is templating some order. And so retroactively, coming back to the data I showed you at the very beginning of the talk, uh, we, we can measure in-plane to outer-plane anisotropy in thin films, which we assumed was just the shape effect. And I think that's there. That's part of it. But as part of that, we, we suspect there's also some surface templated anisotropy there as well. It just happens to be pointed in exactly the same direction as the shape anisotropy, so we had no idea it was there. So this is sort of giving us a lot of interesting food for thought. From an applications perspective, this now gives us the capability to grow different shapes with different anisotropies. You can imagine growing rings, and spheres, and other things. Um, if you want to get really exotic, this looks like a 1D magnon crystal. Um, those interfaces may do something to the propagation of spin waves, um, although we haven't done those experiments yet. So, um, and then sort of casting light all the way back on the fundamental questions of structure and property, uh, the structure or function relationship of, of, of this magnetization, it seems like there is actually some order there and it does do something. And we are trying to come up with creative tools to figure out how to get in there and find it. Yeah, sorry. So it, this is really cool. So, so to me, this just looks like a stack of films on its side. Like, it, like the quote yes. on me putting them, like 100, yeah. I'm looking 200 nanometers down this way. But what you're saying is it mattered that it started growing at the bottom and went, went this direction instead of me laying it down like on a large, you know, uh, planar surface. Somehow it matters that it's like the growth field, like its next nearest neighbor is itself, or something. You know what I'm trying to say? Somehow that. Yeah, matters. I think I think though it's um, so from the way you framed it, I think it would be less surprising. So, and, well, no, no, never, never mind. So I was saying like I mean, if you're growing stuff. Ninety degrees. Yeah, yeah. It looks like a stack of like, you put down. Yes, so, so we could do it that way. And actually, I have some slides at the end yeah. where we're making heterostructures. But you don't see that. 
don't um, see these problems. Well, I think the problem there is that the signal we look for yeah. to see whether that's happening, yeah. at least in the magnetic properties, has exactly the same sign as oh. the signal that you get from a larger plate. I didn't understand that. So you, you can't decouple. Exactly. Okay, okay. It's only by turning it sideways huh. that we basically rotate this anisotropy by 90 degrees, yeah. but we keep the film anisotropy still yeah. perpendicular to the bulk substrate. It. So as we sort of do this, then we see it again. This still remains, but now we get this additional component uh, orthogonal. Uh, so, so this then um, was happening simultaneously with uh, another experiment aimed at anisotropy, or not aimed at it, but exhibiting anisotropy that uh, was going on at the same time. So this is a related compound, vanadium METCEC. So the translation of that is you take a TCNE molecule and you replace one of the cyano groups with a carboxylic acid, um, and so or a carboxyl group. Excuse me. Um, and so this changes the electronegativity, it changes the bulkiness or the steric nature of this ligand, and it removes one of these binding points for vanadium. So we initially did this, uh, we're looking at this material as a way to tune the magnetic properties, um, but we, when looking at the temperature dependence, um, we looked at the magnetic resonance as we rotate from in plane to outer plane. And so at high temperature, this is exactly the shift in center frequency that you expect from this thin film magnetic anisotropy. So as you go to out of plane, um, sorry, this is in plane, this is out of plane. Um, so as you, as you go to out of plane, you need to apply, no, this is in plane. You need to apply less magnetic field. Sorry, there's a minus sign there that trips me up every time. But basically, you. The, the magnetic resonance is shifted by the demagnetizing field. It provides some additional field on top of the field provided by your magnet. And this shift is consistent with what you expect from a magnetic plane. But then when we cooled it down to 80K, we found, so the spectrum gets messy because this material is messier than BTC and E. Um, that's not, that, that's a sort of a separate topic. But if you'll notice, this trend is now going in the opposite direction. And so if we, just track those two behaviors at low temperature and high temperature, you get these uh, phase flipped variations. So what this means is that we've been able now to switch the easy axis from out of plane to in plane. So coming back to the intuition we built up from the snail wire study, this means that we have at high temperature some easy axis in plane defined by shape anisotropy. But at low temperature, there's a transition. We think this actually may be a structural phase transition in the material where a crystal field anisotropy turns on with a different symmetry. So it pushes the easy axis from in plane to out of plane. And in fact, because it, it goes through zero, we can actually say the sign of this crystal field anisotropy is negative. And so in order to have a crystal field anisotropy, you have to have some crystalline order. So this is sort of further evidence that, and now this is not the in-plane rotation I was talking with the nanomars. This is all in-plane to out of plane. And this is sort of another way of pulling out the degeneracy that I mentioned before. So with the nanowires, what we're doing is we're effectively rotating one of these anisotropies to in-plane so that we can detect it. Here, they're still both pointed in this direction at high temperature, and at low temperature, one of them flips. So it's another way to sort of break that degeneracy and see the evidence of this underlying order. And so we're still digging through this data set and trying to understand what we can extract from this, but this is sort of now not, who knows if this is ever useful from an application point of view, but in terms of understanding the fundamental magnetism, this is sort of direction that we think is pretty interesting to move in. Um, okay, so I have one more topic. It's about 15 minutes left. Should, should I cut it and then open questions, or do you want me to just run through the last slides? What's the preferred mode here? You're saying the last section is 15 minutes? Uh, it's probably not. It's probably five or 10 minutes. 
Okay, I just, just want to check. Um, so, uh, this is sort of a, a more chemist's eye view of the material. So I mentioned, so this is the compound, the parent compound, vanadium TCE. I talked uh, in the last section about this METCEC, where we add uh, this functional group. ETCEC, we basically make that functional group even more bulky and more electronegative. So we're sort of, so the reason we had those films in the first place, this anisotropy discovery was basically serendipity, but we're interested in looking at how does the magnetism change as we um, vary the, the ligand. So this is just structural characterization to make sure we're still making a compound. Um, and so here's the, the comparison, here's the magnetization of vanadium METCEC, the one that I, that I was just talking about. And you can see some of the properties are similar. The magnetization actually looks sharper and better at high temperature than low temperature. The qualitative features of the M versus T are still the same. So it starts off in this very magnetic phase and then at a similar temperature of 150 Kelvin, it turns over and starts dropping, although these effects are obviously much more pronounced in the METCEC. And um, the Curie temperature is now just a little bit above 300 Kelvin. So uh, from the pessimist point of view, we didn't make the magnetism any better, we made it worse. The optimist would say, we've now made the second best uh, organic based magnetic <laughs> material by taking the best and you know messing it up. <laughs> but we had some bandwidth to work with um, and so making the ligand more bulky and more electronegative, electronegative sort of it's, one way to say this is it's, it's quenching the long range magnetism, sort of the robust long range magnetic ordering in the film. Um, and then moving even further to this uh, ETCEC ligand, um, you can see this is now only 150 Kelvin where the magnetic ordering kicks in. And depending on the field you apply, you can sort of anneal this out or see the same reentrant physics, which is pushed to lower temperature because basically the Curie temperature has come from 600 Kelvin right on to this low temperature transition. And so um, one of the things that we can do moving among this set of materials is we can essentially uh, show, uh, this is some of the evidence I referred to in the beginning of the talk, that sort of the, the, the general level of order in the film, can, one, one of the things that that will do, making the film more disordered and, and, and making deeper traps will make it harder to delocalize carriers. And as those carriers become more and more localized, the Curie temperature becomes more and more suppressed. So we're sort of killing the long range order and left only with short range. Um, is one way to, to, to look at this data set. So then now just two slides of very speculative preliminary stuff. Um, we can make heterostructures of this. So we can put, uh, and so this is not VTC and E, but ETCEC for historical reasons. We were, as usual, making a sample for other means <laughs> or other reasons, um, but putting it on top of YIG. And then you can play a trick where you vary the in-plane angle. Um, and YIG has a larger magnetization, so it will tune much more broadly as you, as you vary the angle. And so we can walk the frequency of the YIG resonance directly on top of the frequency <coughs> of the organic resonance. And when we do that, you can see the line shape changes dramatically. So um, these peaks, these additional sat, uh, peaks from the uh, organic disappear um, and the resonance, at least this half of the resonance, sharpens up. And so this is a very clear signature of resonant coupling between the two magnetizations. So um, we're still um, working on disentangling whether this is dipole dipole coupling or exchange coupling. Dipole. How do you, how do you know that it's? coupled together because I mean it just looks like they, they could be superimposed well I mean it, it they can't is, is the short answer so um, if you sort of clip you know this uh, part of the graph and just numerically add it to that part of the graph I mean you can tell sort of just by seeing the amplitude of this compared to this 
Right? If you just superimpose these two resonances, it gets lumpy. But at 40 degrees, those features are gone anyway. Well, I think they're I think they're starting to share oscillator amplitude. So I, I think what's so this is basically uh, I think a generic effect if you have two coupled oscillators, right? As they couple, you get a common mode. And I think this is what's happening here. And so you can see there's a there's a kink in the line width um, at about that field. So I, I won't say that this one plot is enough evidence to definitively say that this is happening. Uh, that's that's a fair statement. It's, uh, but it, it's pointing to some interesting potential. Um, and then, yeah, and then we're done. <laughs> so uh, this is sort of the summary. I've just said all of this. It's late in the afternoon. So I'll just leave up a uh, slide of references. Let's look at that and thank everybody for their time. So, time for questions? So electrically, this is a semiconductor, but you get yeah. this earlier. So what, what's the bang gap of this stuff? Well, so this is sort of what I was saying about decades in temperature. So if, if you choose to plot it on a Arrhenius plot, uh -huh. then you get an activation energy of about a, a, a half a um, I'm not quite sure whether it's whether to call that a band gap. Because uh -huh. uh, for a hopping conductor, that activation energy means something different. Um, and, I'm, yeah. and so this may be my personal ignorance. Um, but I don't think the certainly for this material the field hasn't really addressed that question yet. So um, if people have suggestions on on ways to, to sort out that distinction, um, or some measurements would be very interested in hearing about them or collaborating for them. Um, that's the best approximation, best way to answer that. So so what about um, you know, two D patterning? Uh, Magnetic band structure mm -hmm. materials. I mean, what have you have you taken a stab in that direction, or that's in process. So rather than making ridges, you can imagine making little pillars of various lattices. Um, we have effectively done that with pillars of YIG, um, and we get a spectrum with extra lines that are moving around. And so we're in the process of sort of trying to understand exactly what those lines are, and um, although. Uh, that that was more in the spirit of a sample we happen to have, so it's not necessarily in a sort of carefully tailored magnetic crystal structure. Um, but yeah, that's that's a direction we're we're aggressively interested in moving in. And so we we also have some hope that we may be able to pattern uh, using traditional lithography. So uh, one of the other pieces of received wisdom that we got from the prior field was that this material, you can't, can't see any solvents, uh, which makes traditional processing challenging. But it turns out, in the synthesis, uh, there's dichloromethane used at one stage. And so we just tried soaking the films in dichloromethane uh, after they're deposited. And it turns out they're fine. And in principle, that will remove PMMA. So, uh, we're, in, we're basically, well, hopefully my students back at, in Columbus right now are sort of depositing and <laughs> doing some check your iPhone and see. see. Yeah, we can call update. them and find out, yeah. <laughs> uh, but so, and so that's another way uh, to think of, of, of patterning that sort of magnetic crystal. I think the really exciting thing is that um, there's the potential to do that patterning without interfaces, so without the edge damage that you get from ion milling or sort of other etching. Uh, is there any way that you can add more carriers to a system by proximity or...? <laughs> yeah, or so we've, uh, we've thought pretty hard about that. Um, we, we've tried a couple of different approaches to doping, sort of co-depositing with other molecules. Um, none of those have really panned out. Um, I mean, one of the challenges, as we discovered in this process, is that you know, one, one, uh, one person's doping is another person molecule out competing <laughs> here your your desired precursors for, for the right bonding arrangement. Um, but so we've tried that. Um, 
Art Epstein tried some electronic gating um, and didn't see anything, but I wasn't part of those experiments. I'm not sure exactly, how, I'm not sure how, how that was done and, and whether that's really a no. Um, some solid electrolyte gating to really gate the heck out of it might be interesting if we yeah. can come up with a way of doing that without exactly. melting the material. Well, not only that, but this, the solvent issue, if they're, all, they're sensitive to polar solvents, yeah. and depositing the electrolyte is a challenge. Yeah. Um, but yeah. we have material we're working on has exactly the same problem. We do everything with low box, well, so we can talk about that after this is over. Sure. How we're trying to get around that issue. Yeah. So it's really someone's back gated though, right? Yeah, well that's that's the earlier work. Yeah. Um but and not great gate I, I, Yeah. I, I don't know what they tried, how they tried it. And then it's it's not a trivial question how to read it out either. So we don't see, for example, an anomalous hall effect because the mobility is very low. So we would probably need to do some sort of magnetization measurement on, on the as gated material to see if it's affecting the magnetization. So that's not impossible, but that's just a little bit tricky figuring out how to actually do that experiment. So clearly this material is as good as YIG and you, uh, it seems like from your, and, and it has the ability to be like deposited in funny yes. geometries. So what are some of like, you know, wild <laughs> you know, <laughs> things that one could do with this that you couldn't do with YIG? Um, well, I think, for example, this magnon crystal idea is one where we have the potential to have much higher fidelity um, magnon crystals than, than for EA. Um, so I think some, I mean, it's always dangerous to chase an established technology. And so, for example, our collaborators uh, at Yale um, have been working at depositing um, and recrystallizing. So depositing patterned YIG and then recrystallizing it on the substrate to get some nice single crystal material. And I know at least one other group that's doing that. But generally, <coughs> the quality of the yig that you deposit that way um, is not as good as the, the, thin, the, the thin films that were already beating. Um, so my guess is that they would, they would have more damping. And the, yeah, so that's probably the right way to say it. So, so crazier than, than that. Um, I guess my question is these non-reciprocal devices that people are always trying to move oh, the yig, right? Like circulators? Yeah, yeah, yeah circulators. Oh yeah, so, that, so this is what I, uh, I sort of mentioned in passing um, when I showed the, the work with Yale with the two antennas, yeah. we, we just got funding to do exactly that, mm. to try to build a circulator swapping in BTC for yig seeing what the response is, and so we're, we're ramping up. I just hired a postdoc, we'll be starting in February to, to hopefully get that going. So I have a line of uh, crazy devices uh, in the field of this topological uh, devices. There is a, a constant need for flexible, patternable, ferromagnetic insulators. To put, to put on top of topological materials? Yeah, yeah. so if, it, if it's a ferromagnetic metal, then those electrons poison the yeah. logical state. So but, we'd be, we'd but, be, but most ferromagnetic yeah. insulators are you know, difficult to process into devices. Yeah, that has, I'd be very interested in doing something like that. So. Yeah, the question of how thin can you make it? How thin? Um, well, so the thinnest we've deposited is 40 or 50 nanometers. What happens below that? I don't know. We just haven't tried. Um, so, yeah, we haven't really expo explored the thin film regime too strongly, so I don't know if there's like a nucleation layer or, or, or not. Um, or a dead layer? Or a dead, no, maybe even a dead layer, yeah. And, but in the literature, there, there had uh, actually, our Epstein's group uh, did successfully deposit with MLD, sort of layer by layer um, deposition, and they okay. got that to work. This um, same material? 
Yeah, the vanadium TCD. Okay. Uh, with, without the water activation, you know, not, not like aluminum. Sort of a layer of TCME and then a layer of VCO6, a layer of TCME, a layer of VCO6. They use the quartz balance to try and calibrate. So, yeah, I think that was one paper. <laughs> okay. So um, it was hard to do, but maybe so it demonstrates that you can make very thin films. That, that seems to suggest. We've also tried um, just because uh, TCME is actually relatively well behaved molecule. So I tried putting that into a thermal evaporator, organics thermal evaporator, and just depositing a thin layer of TCNE and then putting it in the furnace with only VCO6. Um, and he got the TCNE. It was not this quality. You know, the, it was much messier FMR spectrum. But that, that was a couple of attempts. So just kind of to play around and see what we can do. I would say it, it, we just really hadn't had a compelling reason to try and make super thin films. Uh, at this point, but if there's if there's a, a good motivation to do that, then that's definitely something we could explore. Yeah, maybe it's interesting to study the proximity effect between um, this kind of material and some semiconductor graphene or more traditional. Yeah, so that that we are doing. <laughs> uh, we're sort of collaborating with the Kawakami group uh, to put uh, BTC on top of graphene exactly and look for an anomalous small effect. Anything yet? Uh, not yet. Not yet. Although uh, that's mainly because the first sample didn't survive into the Christ into the Christ. Okay. So we'll just say it at that one. So new graduate student getting used to the technique. This is through the Mersac? Uh Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's part of our two D materials IRG. So th this work is not funded through the Mersac. Okay, let's thank Zeke again.